Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Try. Hope you're doing well. I hope you're having a good weekend, a safe weekend. I want to talk about Shadow Knack by Ralph Ellison. It's this fantastic collection of 22 essays by Ellison, uh, published in 1964, so a dozen years after he had achieved, you know, a great deal of success, a great deal of justifiable fame uh, with writing one of the great novels, if not the greatest, you know, uh, U.S. novel of the 20th century. And uh, this collection of essays, you know, they, they were written across the 1940s, 1950s, right into the early 1960s, and um, they, they span so many different topics. It's not just Ellison on literature. That's the first, like, section of essays is Ellison on literature, Ellison sort of on music, um, jazz, blues, Charlie Parker, Bird. Um, so Ellison on music, and then the third section is sort of Ellison on U.S. culture, um, sociology, social issues, um, that, that's the final section. But what we find is <laughs> it's a window into Ellison's mind. It's a window into U.S. culture and history and arts across the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, and all of the fascinating connections that Ellison makes across all three of those. You know, he's writing in that first section around literature, but he's not just writing about books. <laughs> and he's not just writing about his own works or Richard Wright, who was, you know, a, a sort of mentor and precursor, someone who encouraged him to write. Um, he's not just writing about that. He's writing about history, about the Civil War, about World War II. He's writing about, you know, what's going on with segregation. He's writing about music. He draws distinct links between, you know, the blues and certain works by other writers. And then he does the same thing. When he's writing about music, he's talking about social issues. <laughs> And he does the same thing when he's writing about social issues. He's talking about, you know, just so much that is happening. So much is happening in his world, in his own autobiography. We learn, you know, I think so many people know of Ellison solely because of Invisible Man. It, it is the only, you know, novel that was published really in his own lifetime. I don't, Juneteenth was so much later on. Uh, but but Invisible Man is, is just a, a, a masterpiece. And so many people just solely associate him with that. And they don't realize that Ellison, his ambition was not to become this writer of this, you know, massive work. It was rather to be become a musician. And it might surprise you, it wasn't to become a jazz musician or a blues musician. He wanted to become, a, you know, a celebrated classical musician. That He was trained in that. Um, and so we get these, these windows into growing up in Oklahoma and participating in in a marching band in you know sort of like marching band type drills by uh by uh black veterans of world war one and that was sort of how he grew up that was part of his his upbringing uh he's he really was a true polymath not just with not he wasn't just trained in music but he actually became so fascinated with trying to recreate you know the best possible sound for his for his records. He has a whole section of, of one essay where he talks about going and, and going to the store and getting different parts and putting together better and better and better refined sound systems and creating essentially a fire trap in his apartment with all the wires just because he he you know he really wanted to get the best possible sound. And so there's all of these fascinating, fascinating aspects. You know, there we get dropped into Harlem, but not the Harlem of the Harlem Renaissance, but almost 10 years after that, um, as Bebop is coming along. And, and so there's just so many different ways that, that this book um, has value. And of course, it's all written with that, that just glorious um, way that Ellison takes all these different pieces. He then just sort of uses his al the alchemy of his mind and his heart and just puts it together in a beautiful way for us. So a couple of examples. The blues is an impulse to keep the painful details and episodes of a brutal experience alive in one's aching consciousness, to finger its jagged grain, and to transcend it, not by the consolation of philosophy, but by squeezing from it a near tragic, near comic lyricism. As a form, the blues is an autobiographical example, a chronicle of personal catastrophe expressed lyrically. On that same page, he, uh, I just want to point out, on that same page, he's talking about Richard Wright, uh, a native son, um, and he talks about, you know, the, the horrifying, you know, uh, racist experiences Wright had had in his childhood. He then goes on to make comments about James Joyce, Fyodor Dostoevsky, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Bessie Smith, and Ernest Hemingway, all on one page. <laughs> this, is, this is somebody who was, uh, <laughs> was not a, 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 a one-hit wonder. <laughs> In his mind. In another uh, one, 
Uh, for all our efforts to forget it, the Civil War was the great shaping event, not only of our political and economic life, but of our 20th century fiction. It was the agency through which many of the conflicting elements within the Old Republic were brought to maximum tension, leaving us a nation fully aware of the continental character of our destiny, preparing the emergence of our predominantly industrial economy and our increasingly urban way of life, and transforming us from a nation consisting of two major regions, which could pretend to a unity of values, despite their basic split over fundamental issues, to one which was now consciously divided. To put it drastically, if war, as Clausewitz insisted, is the continuation of politics by other means, it requires little imagination to see American life since the abandonment of the Reconstruction as an abrupt reversal of that formula, meaning that it is now um, uh, poli uh, uh, politics as a continuation of war by other means. The continuation of the Civil War by means other than arms. In this sense, the conflict has not only gone unresolved, but the line between civil war and civil peace has become so blurred as to require of the sensitive man a questioning attitude toward every aspect of the nation's self-image. He sets that, which is maybe the, one of the finest single paragraphs on what the heck is going on in the United States between 1820-ish, 1840-ish, and certainly up into the 1950s one of the finest paragraphs to, to distill that entire century uh, in an introduction to the red badge of courage. I mean, <laughs> they talk, you know, they talk about people who take like certain aspects of, uh, you know, days off at, from work or people who take uh, parts of a game off or they don't play defense. Ralph Ellison was not taking any paragraphs off in his essays. Um, where do we have it? Let's see. Here we go. So how can they remember? Even in swiftly changing America, there are few such moments, and at best, Americans give but a limited attention to history. Too much happens too rapidly, and before we can evaluate it or exhaust its meaning or pleasure, there is something new to concern us. Ours is the tempo of the motion picture, not that of the still camera. And we waste experience as we wasted the forest. Um, could he imagine social media? <laughs> Ralph Ellison would never take a tweet off, let me put it that way. <laughs> um, and, and he just, you know, he, he just continues. There are so many different ways that he just takes what he sees, he takes what he observes, he takes what he learns, he takes um, all of these different pieces and then he combines it together and really examines like what are the connections that exist and how can he make that explicit in the best writing possible. When Negroes are barred from participating in the main institutional life of society, they lose far more than economic privileges or the satisfaction of saluting the flag with unmixed emotions. They lose one of the bulwarks which men place between themselves and the constant threat of chaos. For whatever the assigned function of social institutions, their psychological function is to protect the citizen against the irrational, incalculable forces that hover about the edges of human life, like cosmic destruction lurking within an atomic stockpile. And then in the final essay, uh, he goes, what is needed in our country is not an exchange of pathologies, but a change of the basis of society. This is a job which both Negroes and whites must perform together. In Negro culture, there is much of value for America as a whole. What is needed are Negroes to take it and create of it the uncreated consciousness of their race. In doing so, they will do far more. They'll help create a more human American. And <laughs> I have nothing to add. This is a masterpiece. Each of these essays has something to offer. Um, and he, he's a, he, he really is, is a fan of music, and so the music references are just glorious. I'm going to put in, I'm going to try to put in a couple of links to songs in the description box of artists he mentions, uh, some that are personal favorites of mine. Uh, but uh, th this is an amazing collection. Of course, as I had said, Ellison is most famous for Invisible Man. Please read this, if, if you consider reading this if you have not. Uh, I, I regard it as one of the best books I've ever read. But before you read it, I would recommend reading Native Son by Richard Wright. Um, Ellison is very clear in saying that he doesn't view Invisible Man as a, um, as the child of Native Son, as like, as, as he has a statement about like, you choose your uh, an, uh, ancestors, but you, you can't choose your ancestors, but you do choose your family. And that Wright is one of his ancestors, but that someone like Fyodor Dostoevsky is part of his family. Uh, and, and I thought that was interesting, but Native Son is a great, great pe precursor to um, 
Invisible Man. And James Baldwin comes in for a few references. Um, not just Notes on a Native Son, which there's a couple of essays that uh, Ellison specifically, like, he, he and Baldwin were sometimes grouped together as the two best black writers after Richard Wright, and that each of them was, in a sense, sort of disdaining Wright. And he's very clear about he was not disdaining Wright, and he doesn't feel Baldwin was either. They were each trying to sort of take the next step. Um, but Baldwin's great nonfiction is mentioned. And then there was just a whole group of, you know, U.S. writers that uh, that Ellison was commenting on so spectacularly. Mark Twain and examining, um, you know, the character of Jim in Huckleberry Finn. He had many, you know, fascinating uh, sections on Stephen Crane and the value of Stephen Crane's writing. And of course, William Faulkner. He contrasts uh, Hemingway, who has, as he points out, there's basically like black characters are non-existent, they're totally absent from Hemingway's stories, with um, Faulkner, who struggles with trying to create like authentic real black characters and sometimes allows them to slip either into caricature or into this sort of like wise old man sage, um, as in his fabulous short story, The Bear. Uh, but he, he, he does view Faulkner as someone who's trying uh, to, to sort of rise above the, the racism that had been in his upbringing. And then just to show that he's not like a Dostoevsky like box checker, Ellison makes a reference to Stavrogin from Demons or the Possessed, which is probably the most difficult and densest and possibly the most rewarding book by Fyodor Dostoevsky. And to, to have that just tucked in as a nugget in an essay from the 1940s or 50s by Ralph Ellison was, was delightful. So um, if you've never read Ralph Ellison's nonfiction, he also has a volume called Going to the Territory. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, please let me know if you've read these, if you've read Invisible Man. If you're interested in reading it, I would encourage you to. And uh, I hope you have a great week. Thanks.